Well, hey, parents, thank you for joining us, parents, grandparents. Uh, yeah, we're, we're so glad that you're with us tonight. My name is Matt McDermott. I'm one of the student ministers here, and this is Lake Slaybach. He's our family discipleship director. Um, we're going to be talking uh, tonight uh, as a whole about navigating cultural chaos, but before we do that, I just want to pray for our time together, uh, and I know that, that a lot of people come in here. Um, I just want to let you know, like, Lake and I, we were talking about this this week. It's like... Lake and I are in the thick of parenting, and you're like, oh, man, you must be experts. Well, no, my oldest is just about to turn seven. And so, uh, and, and Lake and I both have uh, kids that are younger than one year old. And so um, we, as, as much as we are in the thick of it, <clears throat> Lake and I also, um, we just have a heart for teenagers, middle schoolers, kids uh, of all ages. And so um, it's our heart that you know that we don't want to be teaching at you. We are just, we want to be like parents helping each other. Uh, to have our kids know Jesus. And so I want to pray to that end. And uh, I, I want you to know that there will be time at your table that you'll get to talk about things that you've heard. And then, um, yeah, we just want to dive into this, uh, this, these topics uh, with the Lord laid on our hearts. So would you join me in praying as we begin our evening? God, thank you that you are creator, sovereign over all things, and that when it comes to the chaos that we are experiencing today, uh, that is not a result of you. You are a God that brings order from chaos. And it is the result of sin that we find ourselves in a world that looks very different than the first two chapters of Genesis. And God, we humbly submit ourselves to you because we have a hard time in connecting with our students and our kids in the ways and all the things that they are going through. So Father, would you help us speak the truth in love? Help us to point our kids to you in all situations? Would your truth help stabilize our hearts? And as we have conversation with our kids, would you help us to point them to you? And Father, ultimately, would the families in here with kids and grandchildren, uh, would they come to faith in Jesus? Would it be through these conversations and, and topics that um, we can lead our kids to know you. Let me ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our topic tonight for our parent equip is called Navigating Cultural Chaos. And I just want to talk a little bit um, as we dive in to just kind of highlight a couple of things that are happening in the cultural moment um, for our teenagers and, and our kids. <clears throat> um, let us just acknowledge what scripture says is true, though. Let's, let's just first say this. Ecclesiastes 1, 9 says this. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. And you're like, Matt, you're reading from, an, uh, from a tablet. You have a laptop computer. We have a microphone. There's nothing new under the sun. Those are new inventions in the last 50 years. Now, that's true. But when Solomon is writing this, he is getting this wisdom from the Lord of just... Hey, situations that people face under the sun. Technology might be new, and, and Solomon created and made some new technology, but nothing that the Lord God has created is brand new to people. There are similar things that are common throughout the ages that are true about situations. The teenage cultural landscape in America is rapidly, rapidly evolving due to unprecedented technology access, shifting social norms, and changing expectations from society, schools, and parents. And yet, what scripture says is true. There's nothing new. Things are evolving rapidly, going quickly, and yet there's nothing new under the sun. There are common truths that are true to Solomon's day that are true till now. This environment offers, then, opportunities for advancement, but also presents challenges that affects teenagers' mental health, uh, identity formation, social interactions, and worldview. So here are a couple things that our teenagers are facing in this cultural moment digitally. This generation is characterized by its deep immersion of its digital world. T today's teenagers, known as digital natives, they have grown up alongside smartphones, social media, and constant internet access. Platforms such as Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat play a central role in their lives today, serving as a space for content creation, consumption, and sharing. And while these platforms do provide creative opportunities and enablement for teenagers to connect, they also contribute to a culture of comparison, seeking superficial validation, and heightened anxiety. Social media often are curated, curated to showcase life's best aspects can make teenagers feel inadequate when comparing themselves to others. 
They see what other people are doing and they feel inadequate themselves. They feel the pressure to uphold a specific image or participate in trends that can then lead to feeling disconnected from their true selves. For many teenagers, platforms like YouTube and TikTok, they allow themselves to learn from different matters of faith and social justice, environmentalism, and mental health in other ways that previous generations just didn't know. Before the internet, there was a connectivity that we didn't know that we could experience in life. And so it's access and access to different thought and different ways that we can learn. And so uh, the, this combination of intense connectivity and a growing awareness of social issues that arise in teenagers reflects the complexities of living in a digital age, but also mentally. The rise in mental health issues among teenagers is a major concern. Pressure to succeed academically, socially, and even online has led to high rates of anxiety and depression. The pandemic also worsened things. Uh, before the pandemic, um, the, the rate at which kids were going into the ER was kind of relatively low, but as the pandemic uh, spiked uh, in March of 2020 and then, and then afterwards, the, the rates of kids that needed to, to, to have some connection uh, to a medical provider uh, increased, including in the ER, and it was just... Uh, making things worse for people. It's good that teenagers are more aware of their mental health, yes, but it often comes with a lack of adequate support. The stigma around seeking help is diminishing, and more teens are, are open about attending therapy and using mental health apps, which is great, but it reflects a culture shift where emotional being is given more weight despite increasing teenage demand. Teenagers today are growing up in a society that increasingly recognizes the fluidity of identity. Teens are asking themselves this question, who am I? And then looking in platforms and other opportunities to find out the answer to that question. They are answering that question revolving their gender, their sexuality, their personal identity, and more. Plus, they're looking at their digital world and seeing a variety of accepted identities more than ever. And as such, the cultural moment that our teenagers find ourselves in is marked by both progress and also tension in how identity is understood and expressed. And then also socially. The impact of technology on the way teenagers socialize has been profound. Unlike previous generations, today's teenagers largely rely on screens for interaction rather than face-to-face -face communication. The difficulty that students have coming in on student night for small group or just even in schools to have a face-to-face -face conversation is so challenging, right? It's like, I don't know anyone. Well, because you have a difficult time speaking face to face and even getting to know someone's name, even though they're at the same place, the same week, uh, day of the week, uh, every week, and it's hard to connect. The shift has significantly affected their communication skills, their emotional intelligence, and their ability to form deep, meaningful relationships. Many teenagers find it challenging to communicate in person and often feel more at ease expressing themselves through text messages or social media. This has led to somewhat would describe some would describe as uh, empathy deficits, suggesting that teens may struggle to understand the emotions of others due to a lack of richness in their own in their primary mode of communication. And yet, and yet, you have been called to parent in this age, <laughs> in, a, in an age where digitally you might feel behind, socially you might see that your kid is is lacking, even mentally you might not know how to connect with your kid's mental health. Ephesians 2, uh, 10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. When I consider this passage as Christians, I often think of like the opportunity that is in front of us. You know who created that opportunity for us? Ephesians 2, said, 10 says it's God. God prepared ahead of time for you to live in this culturally chaotic world. Not because you're great, <laughs> But in some way, it's because of your inadequacy that God has prepared today for you to rely upon him. God has prepared this cultural moment for you to parent in, to say, hey, I, have, I am here for you and I'm going to equip you for this cultural moment. God created this moment for good works and you as a parent should walk in them because God loves you and he is for you. And if you feel the weight of all of this, Ephesians 2, 18 says that through Christ, we both have access to the Father. Meaning that because this is true, God prepared good works for us to walk in. Because we are in Christ, we have access to the Father to help us through these times. 
and we're, we're going to hear from Lake in just a few minutes, is the truth that is found in Scripture, the access that we have to the Father and the Spirit that is enabling all of this is for us today. And it is God telling us, hey, I have prepared this day for you. Today was meant for you, and I'm going to prepare you for it. Paul goes on to say this in Ephesians chapter 4. And he, this, he's talking about the church, but I'll, I'll connect this to parenting. And he, God himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we have all reached unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's son, growing into maturity with the stature measured by Christ's fullness. This could ultimately say in connection to parents that God gave kids parents. God gave kids parents to equip the kids for life. All of life is ministry. And for Christians, we connect our faith into saying, hey, the life that we live is all of it is ministry. And so God gave kids parents to build them up to know Jesus until they have reached unity in the faith with all of us. Knowledge of God's son, growing in maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. He goes on to say this, when that is the case, when pastors, when ministry leaders, when they're equipping the saints and when parents are equipping their kids, they will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning, with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. But here's how we do it. Speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body fitted and knitted together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in the love by the proper working of each individual part. Parents, you have been given this moment to prepare your kids to know themselves so they wouldn't be tossing back and forth by every teaching, going to TikTok and going to YouTube to hear what everything else might tell them who they actually are. But God has given your teenagers, your kids, you, a parent who loves Jesus, who's striving to follow after him, and he has given you access to the Father so that you could know him to know common truths that could help you in these situations. And in a world full of changing trends and beliefs and ideologies, it's easy for teenagers to be tossed by the waves blown around. But in today's cultural moment, when it's hard to decide what is true, in light of what Paul is saying here, tonight I hope that you leave here equipped to be able to speak to your kid love and truth so that they would know their true identity so that they would know who they are in Christ and that when they come to age and to fullness of maturity, and we're gonna pray for that day for your kids, that they would be connected into the body of Christ with you. Can you imagine one day looking at your son or daughter and not seeing a son or daughter by blood, but seeing a brother or sister by Christ's blood? That's the hope for tonight. That in speaking the truth in love, they would know truth and they would know their identity so that you would be raising a brother or sister in Christ. That's tonight's goal. And that, that can kind of be challenging because of the things that we're gonna talk about. And so I just wanna turn things over to Lake who's gonna to speak to some of the common truths that scripture will teach, uh, will teach on how to do this well. Yeah, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Lake. I'm the director of family discipleship. Um, if we haven't had the chance to meet my wife, Ellie and I and our kids, uh, moved here in May, so we're still relatively new. Um, but as we get started tonight, uh, I think all of us probably have experienced before in life, whether it's something that we're working on at work or it's something going on within our family, um, uh, something that we've, we've become hyper fixated on and we've gotten so close to it that, you know, the saying, we, we can't see the forest for the trees, right? Has anybody experienced this before? Another word for it might be spiraling, right? We're just going down and down this, this rabbit hole and we can't seem to get ourselves out of it. And, and so as we begin to talk tonight about some things that are really challenging and difficult and uh, are, are, are really tough uh, in today's society and culture, I think it would be beneficial for us right off the bat to just establish some common truths, some common ground um, that as we, we start getting more into the weeds that we are able to kind of look back and cling to these truths and, and kind of get our head back out of it a little bit and, and breathe for a second. And, and these are all things that we, that we probably know, and as we read through them, we're probably going to say, okay, yes, I know that, I believe that. 
but I think they're going to help us as we, um, they're going to help orient us as we go along in this conversation. So the first uh, common truth for tonight is that God is the creator of all things. Um, that as, as we prepare to have conversations with our sons and daughters about things that are really chaotic and confusing, um, grounding ourselves and grounding them in the fact that God is the creator of all things is going to be really helpful. Um, something that our kids uh, understand is the idea of being a creator. Uh, whether it's something that they're working on for school, a craft, a project, uh, maybe it's a video game that they're playing, Legos, Minecraft, whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, my, my kids right now really like magnetiles. So they understand creating things. And that as they're creating things, the creator understands best how that thing works. Uh, they, they built it. They know it like the back of their hand. And as the creator of the universe, God understands us and life better than we do. And so he's the one who gets to establish the rules for how life works best. And, and so I think that language communicating with our kids when, when people are going against God's design, against the rules that he's set up for how creation should function, is going to be language that they're able to at least somewhat resonate with and, and will help orient us in that conversation. Um, second, second truth. Um, parents, Matt hit on this pretty well, so I won't, I won't I won't overdo this, but parents are uniquely gifted in place to raise their kids. Um, parenting is not meant to be easy. It, it's meant to be for their good, our kids' good, and for God's glory. Um, Paul David Tripp in his book, Parenting, talks about the idea of that there's no other area of life that, that we get frustrated um, for things working the way they're supposed to, um, that our kids need parents, and we are there to parent them. But it can be frustrating sometimes when we feel like, man, my kids, they need parenting. They need somebody to tell them how it works and to teach them how to act and how not to act. And, and they need somebody to point them to Jesus. And, and in the day-to-day -day life that we live, um, it can be inconvenient. It can be the last straw at the end of a long day. Um, but parenting is something that we've been not just gifted and placed to do, but it's, it's how it's supposed to work. Uh, our kids should be parented because they need it. Um, and then a, a final implication for this um, we're their parents, not their friends right now. That one's not fun. Everybody wants to be friends, right? And, and Lord willing, we're going to raise our kids, and they're going to know, love, and follow Jesus, and they're going to, you know, get married and have a family of their own or, or whatever the Lord has for them. And when that season comes, it's going to be awesome to be friends with our kids. It's going to be so much fun. Uh, I've experienced that with my dad. Uh, my wife Ellie's parents, we're great friends with them. Um, it's a lot of fun to be friends with your parents, but that's not what God's called us to right now. He's called us to be their parent, and, and so there's a way that we can parent now that sets us up better or worse for friendship in the future, for sure, for sure. Uh, so we want to make sure that we're doing that well, but uh, we need to remember that we've been placed to parent them, not to friend them right now, although we want to be friendly. Uh, number three, um, this world is not our home, but it is our mission field. If you were in uh, church this morning, Pastor JT talked about this a little bit. Um, he talked about the, the Homer Simpson uh, gif where Homer just disappears back into the bushes and how right now for a lot of us that feels like maybe that's the best option is just to kind of fade back into the bushes and, and get out of everything that's going on around us. Um, but that's not what we've been called to. We've been called to go and reach and engage a lost and dying world with the gospel. Um, and so we, I think two implications of this is that one, we can't just withdraw from the mission field. Um, two is we need to be ready to accept um, criticism, ostracization, um, whatever comes along with our kids communicating truth when it's unpopular. Um, it, when our kids, uh, Lord willing, speak up and speak out for what is true and what is right and, and for Jesus Christ, um, we have to be ready to accept the consequences of that without apologizing, without reprimanding them so that somebody else sees, so that we're off the hook. Um, whatever that looks like, we have to be ready to, to step up because we've been uh, created as their parents um, and gifted to step up for them in a world that's our mission field. Uh, number four, uh, salvation belongs to the Lord. Um, this one should be a, a, a little bit of a deep breath, right? Like, our, our kids' uh, salvation is in the hands of Christ alone. Um, we don't have the power to, to save our kids. 
um, to convince them to be saved. Um, we don't have the power to save their friends. We have the power to be faithful and, and to pray and to trust that the Holy Spirit will be active in their lives. We have the power to, to teach them God's word as best we can and so that that word will take root in their hearts and minds and, and will one day bear fruit. We have the power to do what we can do. And then we can take a, a deep breath and know that their good choices, their bad choices um, are, are not on us. Um, it also means that we should not be in the business of writing people off that God may not have written off either. Um, so as we're interacting with culture and with people that are outside of our families, um, the easy thing to do would be to look at our sons and daughters and say, well, they're crazy, that's nuts, we're not going to talk about that. That would be the easy thing. But the right thing is to say, well, how about we pray with them or pray for them and, and continue to try and be their friend. Um, so that's uh, number four. Number five, um, parenting is done over the course of a lifetime, but each conversation matters. I think there's kind of two ends of, a, of the spectrum on this, that, that on the one side, we can be tempted to throw our hands up and just kind of say, like, oh, we'll get to that later. That's a, that's a lot to deal with right now. Uh, in the words of my dad growing up, like, I don't want to get into all that. That's, he would say that a lot. Uh, and, and that's, that's a real temptation is, is when our kids ask us a question that's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? That it would be easy to say like, oh, we'll talk about it later and then they'll forget about it because they will and go about whatever they're doing. Uh, the other side that we can fall off on is to feel so much weight in every conversation that we have that we squeeze so tightly to try and make sure that they understand every last detail of every intricate thing that could ever come up in their life that we Choke them out, right? And, and so as we're having these conversations, we need to remember that parenting is done over the course of a lifetime. So yes, if, if today's conversation wasn't great, there will be a conversation tomorrow and there will be one next week and the week after that. But also, we shouldn't just wait until they're 17 or 18 or 19 or 20 or however old they are and, and then say, okay, well now that they're really leaving the house, we need to get them, get them ready in this next six months. We, we, we have to take advantage of the time that we've been given, starting today, and, and do the most we can with it while also not being so tight-fisted that, that we squeeze the life out of them. All right, number six, last one, I promise. Uh, parenting is sinners leading other sinners made in the image of God to know the Lord as they know the Lord. Um, there's a lot of people have said this a lot of different ways. Um, somebody... I, I don't know who off the top of my head said that I'm just a piece of clay telling other pieces of clay what's the potter like. Um, but this general idea is true of, of us as parents, that, that our job is to point them to Jesus. So morality isn't the answer. Uh, there's a way that we teach our kids everything that they need to know uh, about homosexuality and transgenderism, about technology, about uh, what it means to be pro-life or pro-choice, about all of these other things. That we can teach them everything they need to know, and they can be really good and could get 100 on a test about that stuff, but they don't know Jesus, and morality kills them just as quickly as sin does. There's a way that we can be so focused on their morality and leave Jesus out of it, and in the end, that way leads to death just as quickly. And, and so we as parents... While we are having hard conversations, and yes, we are telling them this is right, this is wrong. We are, we are showing them morality. We are showing them Jesus just as much, if not more. Uh, and then that also means that we speak with kindness, humility, and gentleness. When we're speaking with them, when we're interacting with whoever it might be that we're interacting with, uh, a teammate, a coach, uh, a parent, a teacher, that we want to do that with kindness and, and in a way that Jesus would do it. And so as we have, uh, we have a couple examples, a couple case studies that we're going to walk through of different situations that might, might arise. And, and I just want these to be some common truths. Um, you know, each of these applies to all of the things we're about to talk about. So every time that we come up with one of these case studies, I could say, all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, and they all work. So we're not going to do that, but I think they're going to be some good groundwork for us um, and help us have something to fall back on. Yeah, so we wanted to talk about case studies in the, in the way that it's like we're not, we don't want to just provide you the answers. Uh, like that's not what parenting is. Parenting isn't just like, hey, we're going to get this to them. We want to apply the common truths that these are to these situations and ultimately speak to where scripture kind of leads us uh, to finding these truths. So I just want to cover all the, the common truths again, just so that you know where we're going through. So number one, God is the creator of all things. Number two, parents are uniquely gifted and placed to raise their children. Number three, this world is not our home, but is our mission field. Number four, salvation belongs to the 
Lord. Number five, parenting is, is done over the course of a lifetime, but each conversation matters. Parenting, number six, is sinners leading other sinners made in the image of God to know the Lord as they know the Lord. And so we just have a couple of case studies that we want to engage with, and then we're going to give you some time at your table to engage with these common truths as well. So, like, let me uh, throw you some of these uh, case studies. We do have some more if uh, y'all aren't pleased with some of these. We have some heavier ones that we can toss on Lake as well. So, uh, Lake, you have— what everybody came here for. Yeah, exactly. More heaviness, right? So, Lake, you have uh, two daughters— and uh, a boy. Um, if one of them comes home from school, let's say when they when they are eight, let's go for an eight year old first. Okay. okay? Um, they come home from school and they say, "Dad, what does it mean to be pro-choice? What do you do? How does the common truths apply to that situation?" Yeah. So this is one that's probably coming up uh, a lot more frequently right now as we enter the election season. Um, what does it mean to be pro-choice? I think the two, the uh, like I said, all of the all of the common truths apply to all of them. But the two that come to mind first and foremost are that God's a creator of all things. So when we're talking about what is life, um, what what is in a mama's womb, um, we need to be talking about who is creating that. And if that person is creating it, then they set up the rules about what that is and what that isn't. Um, also within that is the fact that God is putting His uh, image. On, on those children in their mother's womb. Um, and so uh, that would be one common truth that I would spend some time talking about. And then also just parents are uniquely gifted and placed to uh, raise their children. Um, that for some mamas and dadas, that seems like, I'm sorry, I'm talking about mamas and dadas. You can tell how old <laughs> my kids are. You have young kids. Yeah, yeah, I have young kids. Yeah. Uh, they're not eight. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't use that for an eight-year-old. Uh, for some moms and dads, that seems overwhelming. And that they might look for other alternatives instead of leaning into the responsibility that God's given them by, by blessing them with a baby. Um, but that he has given them that baby on purpose and that it doesn't surprise him. And that there is a unique way that if they lean into the calling that God's placed on them, um, that he's created them just like he's created their child for them to raise them. Yeah, so now let's say little Luke, which is one of his, I called Luke, Luke is my kid. I was going to say Lake, little Lake, one of your kids. Uh, let's say little Lake uh, is, is 16, and the conversation is changing a little bit, and it turns into, hey, Dad, why aren't we pro-choice? Can I ask you that question? Again, yeah. we did not yep. prepare for that yeah. question. I just want to let you know. But hey, yeah. Dad, why aren't Dad? Why aren't we pro-choice? Yeah, as I think, Christians, I think leaning a lot into the the creation thing. Uh, one of the other things that a um, uh, quote that I pulled from the book um, about human dignity. Human dignity supplies Christians with the ability to amicably disagree while respecting the value of all persons. So with a, um, that was from What Do I Say When, which is on the back table, and a lot of this conversation is based on this book that Matt and I have read. We should have probably said that before right now. No, this is all us. Like, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, this is a lot of Andrew and Christian Walker. Uh, so uh, I would uh, lean into that human dignity, that, that the human dignity that allows you and your classmates to have this conversation without it turning into a fist fight, hopefully, uh, is the same dignity that God's placing on that child in its mother's womb. Um, and so if the argument goes that, that the mother should have a choice, um, then the mom and the child are equally valuable. And, and so then the question becomes, can that child choose for themselves? And the answer to that is no, because they're in their mother's womb. And we would have a, a longer conversation about what it means to protect those who can't protect themselves to be a voice for the voiceless. Yeah, I think the increase value, dignity, worth conversation that their image bears is the, the primary thing that we should go after in these types of conversations. The reason why we uh, deny ourselves uh, the 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 things of our actions and we make life not easy for us and we because we value other people and we know that they're made in the image of God and so we want to support and love and care for people who um, can't value and love themselves and who are unprotected and so we we are valuing that to say that person is made in the image of God and so even if they don't bring any value to the table. Um, we want to honor them because, not because of uh, I'm a great person, but because God who made them has his image upon them. And so we're going to increase that value. And so, yeah, I think the conversation always has to begin with, even if they're 8 or 15, it always begins with they're made in the image of God. 
God has placed value, dignity, and worth of, over that person. And even uh, you, as uh, an image bearer, you don't get to deny the image bearing of someone else, right? You, we, we have to honor the Lord in, in doing that. All right, uh, next one. You're in a public place as a family, and you see a homosexual couple. You notice your son or daughter is staring. How do you engage with them in that moment? Uh, I'm going to use my last God is the creator of all things card. I won't say it again after that. I would, I would go to that one. Um, also, the world's not our home, but it is, is our mission field. So we're going to see things in this world that are going to make us uncomfortable, that we're going to recognize this is not what's right. Um, and that's because the world's not our home. So we, we don't act and behave the way that the world acts and behaves. But we also don't withdraw from it. So when we see people who are doing things that are contrary to our lifestyle, contrary to our beliefs, contrary to what we know is true as Christians, uh, we're not going to shun them. We're not going to avoid them. Uh, we're going to be winsome. We're going to be friendly. We're going to be kind. Um, there's a really good book uh, by a lady named Rosaria Butterfield uh, called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Uh, if you're not familiar with Rosaria Butterfield, she has a really radical story of um, being one to Christ uh, out of a homosexual lifestyle, and it's a really great book. Um, and so we're going to engage these people because they are our mission field, just like uh, the whole world is our mission field. Um, and then also um, parenting as sinners, uh, leading other sinners made in the image of God to know the Lord like they know the Lord. So we want to do this with, with grace, with charity. Um, we want to be kind. Um, and we also want to emphasize to our kids that, that, once again, it's not morality. It's not that if they stop being homosexual, then they will have eternal life. That's not the gospel. Um, the gospel is that if they turn to Christ, repent of their sins, and believe, then they will have eternal life. And so it's not a, a slight change in their morality that's going to save them. It's a complete 180 and, and belief in Christ. Yeah, had this happened to me in my own household uh, when my son, um, we were engaging with our neighbor, and uh, part of the conversation was, uh, hey, we as people are sinners, and he knows that because he comes to church here. He recognizes that he's a sinner, and it's hard for him to understand that other people are sinners as well. And so uh, he thinks his dad is perfect, and I had to remind him, no, I need Jesus just like you need Jesus, just like they need Jesus, which is Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, uh, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, uh, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will not inherit God's kingdom, which is Lake's point. But such were some of you, right? But you were washed. That's the thing. It's not because you changed and made yourself morally better. It's because you came to know Jesus. And so as we have these conversations too, uh, I have to recognize that, hey, they need Jesus just like I need Jesus. Like just because we're Christians and we don't act in that way does not make us superior in any way. You need Jesus just like they need Jesus. And so when I tell him, because he's a believer, when I tell him, hey, the gospel that you know can, is the gospel that they need to know, it becomes the world is our mission field. It becomes, oh, we can pray for our neighbor. We can pray for our friend to say, oh, I, wanna, I want them to know Jesus just like I know Jesus. It's just a slight turn in the conversation that we need to begin to lean into. Anything I, else we want to add to Yeah, that? one other thing, I, another quote from the book that I thought was really good, that uh, on the topic of sexuality, uh, they said, Christians believe God's plan for sexuality is not arbitrary or restrictive. They went on to say biblical sexuality is the only path that leads to true personal and cultural flourishing. And so I think on the flip side of this, while we could spend a lot of time um, explaining to our kids what sexuality is not, um, I also think there's a place for us as parents to, in an age-appropriate way, ex paint a picture of what biblical sexuality is and what that looks like. Um, there's a, another old quote. I'm using quotes. I don't know the people that said them, but... Uh, you said them. Like, yeah, yeah, no, I didn't say them. <laughs> uh, but they, uh, it says, like, how do you teach men, how do you, how do you get men to build a boat? Does anybody know this one? How do you get men to build a boat? You teach them to long for the sea. Like, if you want the sea, you're going to build a boat because you want to get out there on it, right? And so I think that there's a way that we can teach our kids about sexuality that's like, no, 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 no. And there's definitely times that no needs to be said. Um, but there's also a way that as they grow and mature and it becomes more and more appropriate for us to do so, uh, given their age, for us to plant, uh, uh, paint a picture of what sexuality should look like and that it's not arbitrary or restrictive, that it's to be enjoyed within the confines of marriage. 
Yeah, and, and for teenagers, um, this doesn't happen quite as often in public or in your van rides or car rides or whatever, but, but teenagers can speak demeaning of people. I'm not sure if you know this about teenagers. They can speak down on people. And so one of the things we do in students is when there is like degrading talk, um, when people call one another uh, gay or they make any demeaning kind of sp- speech to another person, uh, we call it out. We, we, we speak uh, against it um, because there are, I mean, statistically speaking, there are probably um, same-sex attracted students in our student ministry. I've experienced that in our student ministries prior where there was a dignity, value, and worth of a person placed on them being an image bearer that we had to protect because they were following after Jesus. That in the way that they, uh, my teenagers or another teenager was speaking against, It created an unsafe space for them to know and follow Jesus. And so if I hear that in uh, the group of guys that I'm with or even with my own kids, I need to speak to uh, that God made them in in his own own image that I need to protect, that I need to guard, and I need to speak into my kids' or teenagers' life so that they know, hey, this person has value, dignity, and worth. And my speech kind of portrays that. I think is a good way to do it. Another way to say it is yeah. there's, a, there's a way that you say something that's true, but it's unkind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, and in that moment, it, I'm going to say that to my kid. Like, they, they, it's going to be a harsh word, um, but there's a word that, that is harsh that brings about um, rebuke that's, a, that's kind. The Proverbs speak to this, that there's a kiss of rebuke that is kind. But there's flattery that just lets it go that is unkind. It's like a trap that's laid before you that I'm just letting you walk in, right? And so as a parent, I need to be engaged in that conversation with them. When I hear it, I have to shut it down right away. And there's a way, like, again, sinners leading sinners. There's a way that I can do it that's kind. And then there's a way that I can do it that's saying, just just shut up, right? I can end the conversation or I can parent, as I'm supposed to do, and I can actually lean into it. Um, And as a parent, I know that that's exhausting, (laughs) Right? But like we're, like we're called to, hey, we are called to parent. This is the season. Friends let those things slide as friends, but as parents, we, we need to uh, speak into those things. All right, case study number three. You're at an open house at the beginning of the school year. You meet a couple, and as you're talking with them, their son walks up, and instead of introducing you to their son, they introduce him as their daughter. How do you prepare your son or daughter for the year ahead? Like, Yeah, I think the two common truths here um, – the world's not our home; it's our mission field. So we're gonna we're gonna be kind. We're gonna make friends with this student. We're gonna engage them and hopefully share the gospel. Um, and then also, I think the I think the bigger one in this moment is parenting is done over the course of a lifetime, but each conversation matters. Um, that I think uh, if uh, a lot of us were to experience something like this, and maybe maybe some of you have experienced something like this. Um, that in the moment, it could feel like, I mean, we, we hear about this all the time. We talk about it in Christian circles a lot. And so it could feel a little bit like, oh, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. Like, I've heard about this for a couple of years now, and now I'm being confronted by it. And, and the pressure that comes along with that could lead us to either, you know, disengage, slide back into the bush, or to take our kid home and teach them everything that was ever written or read about transgenderism and that both of those probably wouldn't be right or helpful. And so I think beginning that conversation with our child about, about what is true, what is not true, um, but also coaching them in how to be friends with somebody that we disagree with because of human dignity and value and worth, um, and then hopefully winning them over with the gospel over time. Yeah, I think the over time part really matters. How many of you have kids that are under 10? How many of you have any kids are under 10? Yeah, I do. I got three. How many? And then so everyone else o- older than 10, teenagers. Yeah, great. Um, hey, the the thing that we need to recognize is like, hey, for the, you know, I, I have to be faithful to today. That's what God has given me. Lord willing, he'll give me another 10 years with my teenager. But today also matters to lean into the conversation. Uh, and contextually, the conversation changes over time. So like we have, I'm going to put you on the spot, like. I'm great for the first time tonight. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, the foundational truths of kids ministry. Oh yeah. Do you know do you know what they are? Not off the top of my head. Can no. you give me one of them? Anyone can got Jenna can anyone can give me one? Can we get one? I only know it because it's a song that we sing. God made everything, right? Yeah, there you God go. God made everything. I told you to put you on the spot. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Uh, God made everything is one, is one of those foundational truths that if your kid is in preschool, elementary school, whatever, even in students, we talk about the foundational truths 
they scale up. They scale up in like, hey, this thing, you can understand this when you are six. You can understand this when you're three. But then that conversation needs to change when they're 10 to when they're 15. So even into this situation, uh, I need to contextualize what that looks like for my seven-year-old as we have that conversation. Uh, the way that we do that for our six-year-old is we have just some, some small little blurbs that we use just on repeat. Um, we're like catechizing him, like using small phrases to just teach him over and over, just in small blurbs. And then that will build on itself when he's 12 and 15 uh, and, and so on and so forth. But um, so if you can, as a family, come up with biblical scriptural truth, but that can come from kids ministry or whatever, um, or what you find in scripture to speak to some of these things, try to contextualize it, put it in the context of your seven-year-old that he might, he or she might understand uh, that God made everything, that God made male and female, whatever it is, you know, however it can connect with uh, the truth that you're speaking to. That's what it looks like, that it's not the same conversation as a 15-year-old, as to a five-year-old. it's Yes, it's over the course of a time, but it's also contextualized to where they are as a five-year-old, as to a 15-year-old. Um, so your kid might come home from school and ask what it means to be pro-choice or why are we not, you know, why are we not Democrats or why are we Republicans? Or what are those things? Or why do we, or why do we hate gay people? Or, you know, the question as a teenager might be different, right? It might be very different. And we just have to speak to their level. That's what contextualizing means. That's what the course of... And I, Lake and I were talking about this. There are some of you that, that it's going to be hard to do that because you've not done it for a while. And I love you enough to say that. It's going to be hard for you to en- engage into that conversation because you've not done it. But you still have time as the parent of your kids to enter into that conversation. And the context might be over your head. You might be like, man, I, I've missed some easy steps over the course of time. But you are still given today to do it. And so just for... For this conversation, yeah, you have the open house at the beginning of the year. How do you prepare your son or daughter for the year ahead? You can really think through how I can help disciple my kid to be engaged in the same class as someone there. Well, we're going to pray for them. We're going we're gonna to be kind to them. You know, however you can contextualize that is really helpful. Anything else you want to add to that? Nope. Sorry, I put you on the spot. Like, I'm okay. so sorry. I had them in front of me. Jesus as saves you, us. As you, that's it. it. That's, you nailed it. I was... I set you up because I was looking them up for because I didn't know if you asked me. Anyways, last one. Last one, and we'll move on. Your son or daughter refuses to publicly yield on one of these matters, and now the principal of the school wants to have a conversation with you. How do you approach this conversation with the principal and then your son or daughter? Yeah, uh, I think uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier when we were going through the common truths the first time, but parents are uniquely gifted in place to raise their children. And salvation belongs to the Lord. So um, teaching our kids that it's our job to, to speak the truth in love, um, that it's not on us to argue somebody into the kingdom of heaven, um, but also being willing as parents um, to sit across from a teacher or a coach or a principal and say, yes, that's what my son or daughter said. Yes, we believe that. No, I'm not apologizing. What do we need to do to move forward? without apologizing um, and being, yeah, it's going to be really uncomfortable. That's not going to be a fun conversation. Um, but then turning around and telling your son or daughter how proud you are of them for speaking truth and standing up for Christ um, in an environment that does not want or appreciate that. Um, I think one of the most damaging things we could do for our kids is for them to speak truth in a public space and then us apologize for it in front of them or behind their back um, to try and get out of an uncomfortable social situation. Um, I think that we should be so overjoyed that our children are speaking up about what is true that we're really willing to, to lose a friend over it um, or to, for things to be uncomfortable when we go to PTA or when we're at the soccer field or whatever the case might be. Um, and so I think just recognizing that we're the adults in the situation and our job is to, to take one on the chin for our son and daughter, uh, son or daughter when, when that needs to be the case and uh, to turn around and cheer them on as they continue to pursue obedience. Yeah, when our kids are right and they're, and they're uh, obeying and being faithful to the Lord, the best encouragement that they need from you is to tell them that you're proud of them as a way of honoring them. Like for them to be, I mean, 
for them to go into middle school, public middle school, public high school, into a very dark place, and for them to hold on faithfully, the best thing that they can receive in this life is to hear from their parent, hey, great job. I am proud of you. And for you to stick up for them, to Lake's point, is like a huge win for them. Like that would be one of the most connecting things if it happens in life. If faithfully they are being faithful to Jesus in a very dark place and they are being torn down for him, uh, by it and you look at them in the eye and say, I, I'm proud of you. I am proud of you and Jesus is too because you are being faithful to him. That is exactly what they need to hear. And for you to, in a loving way, uh, honor the principal, uh, but also honor your kid who's being faithful to Jesus. Uh, First Peter 2, 17 says, honor everyone, love the brothers and sisters, fear God, honor the emperor. We sometimes you forget that last bit. We need to be honoring to people who are in positions of power and authority, and a principle is, right? They are. God has placed them in that position. If we understand that God is sovereign over all things, God has placed that principle over the school that your kid is in. And we need to honor that. But there's also a way that we can be faithful to Jesus in how we honor them, that we can then honor our kid because they're being faithful to Jesus too. Yeah. I got more. I, I think wanna... if, if I could just backtrack for a second. Go ahead. Yeah. I spent a lot of the transgender question trying to think of a foundational truth. Uh, and I two things that they said in the book that I think really stood out to me. Um, and uh, the first one was that as our kids are sharing uh, with us what they experience at school, um, that we need to be ready for them to share something that they heard, something that their friends said, something their friends experiencing. Uh, we need to be ready for them to say something that's going to make us really uncomfortable. And we need to be ready to hopefully try our best not to show that reaction. Because um, our kids, as they're telling us things that somebody said at school, somebody, somebody, oh, so-and-so is, uh, they were a boy, but now they're a girl, or whatever the case might be, Um, They're going to be watching our body language for how we respond in those situations. And and what we don't want to do is teach them not to tell us the next time. Um, We want to be a place where they feel like they can come and tell us things um, that they're experiencing at school um, or on on the team or or whatever environment they're in, um, where they can do that. And, And even if we in our hearts are not getting our kids in trouble, right? Like we can hear our kids say something somebody said at school and we can make a face and it's not our kids in trouble. They're just telling us something somebody else said, but to them that can feel like they are in trouble for the thing that they just said or or the thing they just said made mom or dad really uncomfortable or it made them upset or angry. And so then the next time they might just say, ah, forget it. And the next time we might really need to know the information that they're about to share. And so there's a way that we can receive information that we disagree with and then begin that conversation um, and, and thank our children for being honest with us and sharing that with us and, uh, and encourage them to do it the next time. Um, the other thing that they, they said in the book, um, the focus on identity leads to cascading moral confusion. Um, that the more time we spend talking about identity, um, the more identity can be claimed as a way to insulate against critique. Um, so the, if I say something is just a part of my identity, then you can't critique me for that thing. And so whether it's our children or their friends or their teammates, um, I think recognizing that, that identity is not a trump card, even though it feels like it a lot of the time, um, that you can't just say, well, that's my identity and then get away with whatever you want. There's a lot of things that people could do and say identity and we would say, no, you can't, you can't do whatever that is. Um, but with certain things, we let people get off with that. And so I think just uh, reminding our kids that our identity is in Christ, that he's the creator who, who made us and set things up to work a certain way. And, and so we can't just play an identity card and get away with doing whatever we want that's against God's will and purpose for our life. Yeah, that's great. All right, I have one that um, we, we have some time left before we go to the, our table time. But um, uh, this one's at the bottom, Lake, just so that you can see it. But Great. Um, your daughter's grades in school 
are declining and you're unsure why. Uh, she's always been a good student, but recently they are beginning to drop. She's involved in uh, soccer and then after school, she's really into volleyball. She's also on a travel team that you pay to participate into. She gets home most nights between eight and nine o'clock, sometimes participating in church things until 10 o'clock, young life, whatever. Um, as the fight over grades happen, it discovers that your daughter is staying up uh, to one or two o'clock each night watching Netflix on her phone, trying to get her homework done. What would you do in that situation? How do the common truths apply to a situation like that? Yeah, I think that uh, one of the common truths that, uh, or one of the implications of common truths it, that's important to this is that we're, we're parents, we're not friends right now. Um, that we want, uh, a friend wants their friend to do whatever their friend wants to do, right? We want to support them and encourage them, and we want to support and encourage our kids, but we are also there to draw lines and to say, no, you can't handle all the things that are on your plate right now. Um, and so maybe that looks like sitting down and, and writing out what are the things that I'm involved in right now, um, including watching Netflix. Maybe watching Netflix is important, I don't know. Uh, and, and then working with your son or daughter to say, here are the ones that I really, really don't want to drop. And see, maybe there's an easy solution. Maybe they're in band and they hate band, or maybe they're on the soccer team and they hate soccer. And you can say, win-win, cross it off. Um, but at the end of the day, if there's a hard decision to be made, uh, that's, that's where we as parents are gonna step in and say, um, nope, mankind is, is not eternal. We, we, we have bounds. We, we don't have unlimited power and resources and, and we can only do what we can do. And so we're going to prioritize the things that are important to our family. Um, probably like church, um, I would, I would hope would be something important. Um, and then we're going to find some spaces where we can cut other things to give us a little bit more time. Um, if Netflix or whatever, you, if you want to watch a show, then let's create some downtime for you to watch a show that's not at two in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. The The schedule of the week, you know, a lot of times what I hear in student ministry from parents is that like, well, we want to create and instill some independence, right, in our teenagers. We want them to make the choices and create some independence. And those things are true. And yet they're still your kid, right? They're not an adult. And so this is some time for them to, to learn how to create a schedule, to learn how to budget their time well and the things to pursue their, their passions, but also to pursue the things that uh, God has said is primary for them in their lives. And um, if I'm, if I'm can be honest with you for a moment, I'm being honest, kind of candid. Let me be candid. Uh, I have We've a time, been honest the whole time. Yeah, we have been honest the entire time. Let me be candid. Uh, as a 35-year-old, uh, I have a hard time managing my schedule. I have a hard time balancing all the things that I want to pursue. And it, and, and it can be overwhelming for teenagers with all the good things that are available to them for them to say no to something because they have a fear of missing out on something. They look on their phone and they see all the good things that are available to them and they want to participate. But it is actually good for us to discipline ourselves to say no to things so that we can say yes to other things. Hebrews uh, 12, 11 it says, no discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So if I can develop in my teenager and in my kid an opportunity to say no, to say, to, to say yes to something later on, that's a benefit for them. If they can love discipline and love knowledge, then there can be a, a value to them to say no today, to say yes to something greater tomorrow. Uh, anything else that you want to add to that? I think that's it. Yeah, I think we want to um, we want to move to the table time. Um, so we have um, at the on the screen here just two questions at your table that we would love for you to connect with the other parents and adults at your table. So just two questions. Um, you can take about fifteen minutes to talk through them. I would love for everyone to participate at your table. But just two questions: What common truth did you find most applicable to you? Uh, to you? What, what common truth was most applicable to you? And then the next one is, what is the next step for you and your family after this parent equip? So uh, take about 15 minutes. We'd love for each person to participate in this question uh, and answer uh, just timely, and then we'll share uh, back together in just a little bit.
All right, take about five minutes. Five minutes, consider what your next steps are after uh, the parent equip. All right, take about one more minute, and then we, we would love to hear from you the common truths that you found applicable and next steps. Okay, what, what common truth did you find most applicable? We'd love to hear from you on this one. What common truth?
come here and whatnot and doesn't make us any kind of better parent. I mean, I would hope it makes us a little bit better parent. But just the one one event's not going to make us rock star parents. It's just a collective lifetime of trying to strive to be that that better parent that makes us a better parent. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I, I think we heard this last year in, in our proverb series with students, but the one thing I tell students about parents and parenting is that a parent is just like you. They have their own mess. They have their own stuff that's going on. They got a weight of responsibilities, and then you know what God does? He gives them a kid. That's what parenting is, and that blows their mind because they're like, what? My parent doesn't have it all together? No, they don't. Yeah, it's sinners leading sinners to know that they need to love the Lord and that the Lord loves them. That's good. Absolutely. When Lake was talking about, um, you know, the kid, you know, trying to ring out every conversation to be the, the deepest one, I think about my spiritual conversations with my kids. And uh, my oldest son, Jack, is a first grader. He will um, oftentimes look at me at the end of the conversation. This is how I know the conversation is over. He goes, hey, Dad, can we stop right now? <laughs> can we be done? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, Yes. <laughs> Yes, we can, Jack. Yeah, we can be done. And then I remind myself that it's over the, I, it's not all this one conversation, right? It's good that I'm engaging in the conversation today, and it can be done. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Jack. What else? Yeah, I think I think I think of uh, you know when I'm standing in front of the Lord, one day, that uh, one of the questions I'm not anticipating being asked is why did Davy decide to, you know, do whatever. I do think I'm going to get asked why did you decide to, a lot. Um, but yeah, I think that that's just like a huge weight off the chest. If you were to ask Jack, my son, um, what task God gave me over him, he would say that uh, I would know the Lord and be a good man. Like that's, that, that's just the, the question and answer. So that when we come to this stuff, it's like, hey, God gave, so when he mouths back at me about is the conversation over, I'm like, whatever. Uh, I tell him, hey, God gave me this task to, to have you know the Lord. I want you to know the Lord and to make you a good man. That's the task that God has given me. And ultimately, that task is from God. Like, I, I have to put that salvation back onto the Lord. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Tabitha. Anyone else? We'd love to keep hearing these. These are great. All right, like as a dad, you were in this parent to equip with us. Uh, which one, which common truth for you? As you wrote these out and as we yeah. were thinking about these, which one kind of yeah. was sticking out to you? Uh, I think I'll be able to remember one of them this time. <laughs> Sorry again. Yeah, I, uh, it's tough. I think, I think being uniquely gifted in place to raise our children. 
I think that's one that, because um, we know our children better than anyone, so we know all of the very best of what our children do and the other things that they do as well. And uh, it can be easy to, I think, sometimes think like, oh, if, if uh, so-and-so was the parent of this particular child, they would have them straightened out really quick. Not that any of my kids need to be straightened out really quick. But uh, I think that just when you're facing challenges as a parent, it's easy to look at other people and com compare and say, well, like they would not be having this issue with one of their children. Or if they even had my exact child, they probably would be able to figure out what needs to happen in this situation. Um, but realizing that God did not give them your child because they could not, in fact, parent your child. Only, only you can parent the child that God's given you. Um, and so realizing we're doing the best we can do and leaning into it. Um, Lake is not the parent of your kids. Uh, I'm not the parent of your kids. Morgan, Marshall, our other student minister is not the parent of your kids. God has given us, as a part of the church, leadership positions so that we can equip the saints for ministry so that your kids would know Jesus. And so we're going to take every opportunity, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Bible studies, whatever it is, we're going to take every opportunity to share the gospel to your kids and equip them to know Jesus. But ultimately, like salvation is of the Lord, but ultimately like, God did not give um, your kids to, to be under our parentage. Like you are the parent of your kid. God has placed you over them in this moment so that they would know Jesus and uniquely gifted and placed you over your children so that you can connect with them and that they would know your story and knows the way that God has gifted you and how God has gifted them because you are there or because they are your uh, kids. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, what about the next steps for you and your family after this parent equip? Anyone want to share any next steps that you uh, kind of thought about at your table? Next steps. Yeah, great. That's it. <clears throat> I'm so glad someone heard that. That was exactly... <laughs> oh, say again. Oh, he said, oh, he said to lock them in their room. Yeah, lock them in their room. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to. I think, I think, I think, I think that's also uh, a, uh, nothing's new under the sun. But a little bit unique part of the moment we're living in is the uh, access that our kids have to their favorite TV show characters or movie characters. Um, when they're not just watching the movie or the TV show, they're watching, you know, the the reel of them talking about being in the movie or the TV show or about their next project or about their life outside of that and uh, that that can really easily make us feel like we really know that person where 40 years ago it might not have felt like we really knew a movie star or a, a TV star um, and so yeah I think that's that's wise and helpful.
Anyone else? To sit down with them and, and create that schedule with them is really good. Yeah, and then model it for them is good. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, physical training. Paul tells us physical training has great value into it. Like there are great things to be physically disciplined and have great training for those things, but spiritual training is of greater greater value. Yeah, there's a leaning in which you should do to that. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks for sharing. I think that's a, a great reminder too, like that part of us being uniquely gifted to raise our children means that there is not a storyline parents tell their kids to talk about transgenderism this way. There, There is no one size fits all of how to have this conversation. It's knowing your kid, knowing the situation, knowing the, the, the kid that they're going to be having conversations with and interacting with and being able to in the best God-honoring way possible, tailor our responses and conversations to meet our kids where they're at. Uh, I think we are up against it, time-wise, a little bit. Um, by way of, uh, of closing, we have on the back, right there beside a Dan, um, one of these books. Feel free to check it out. Uh, I would highly recommend it. Um, it's, uh, the chapters are really easy and manageable. Um, and then in the back, they've got some um, like questions and conversations that you could ask and have with kids at different uh, levels of childhood. So I think this is a really helpful book. Um, there's another book back there by Rebecca McLaughlin called uh, Secular Creed. Um, and it's similar to this book. It's uh, maybe a little bit more tailored towards, uh, it's, it's not really parenting, it's just towards talking through these things as adults. Um, and then there's a third book back there, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. That's an oldie but goodie. Um, and I think particularly when we talk about morality and, and is there right and wrong and is there absolute truth, that Mere Christianity is a great one that's been around for a while but um, how it speaks to a lot of the root problem of the conversations that we're having today. So uh, feel free to check those out. One of them's in person. The other two are pictures, but there's QR codes below. Um, as we close, I want to just encourage you guys. Um, I know that myself, Matt, Morgan, uh, Jess, our, our whole family discipleship team is super thankful that y'all would spend an evening just talking about how to parent our kids well and point them to Jesus. 
Um, we also want to invite you. Um, there's still water and drinks and stuff in the back. Um, for those of us who are interested, um, students in five minutes is going to be going into worship in our student uh, room just down the way. And we're just going to kind of take a uh, little bit of a field trip out the front and around, and we'll be able to finish up worshiping with our students if you want to. If you've got kids in Kid Keepers and you need to go grab them, we totally understand. But Kid Keepers is available till 7.15, so we do have a little bit more time. Um, maybe not like to run out to Wendy's or something, but there's time to be on campus and uh, enjoy what your students enjoy every week or see what your kids will one day enjoy in students. Um, so we're actually just going to, if you want to grab a drink or something and you want to come with us, we're going to head right out the front and down the sidewalk. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you um, for the honor and responsibility that it is to be parents. Uh, we also, while we've talked about a lot of heavy, heavy stuff tonight, we just thank you for the, the fun that we have with our kids, with our families. Um, we pray that we would be parents who are um, able to love and enjoy and have fun with our kids, um, but they also know that we will engage with them in hard conversations, um, that we will stand up for them and uh, encourage them and empower them to walk in the truth that you've laid out for us in Scripture. Um, God, I just pray for these parents specifically, that you would guide and direct um, their conversations, that you would help them know how to answer and, and love and serve their kids in the best way possible, um, when to um, encourage their kids to, to figure some stuff out on their own and when to step in and help them find the answer. Um, God, I just pray that you would bless and keep their families and uh, that these kids represented in the room tonight would, would, would love and serve you for decades to come. God, we ask all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. All right. If you want to come on the field trip, we're going to head out the back and down the sidewalk. If not, nobody's going to judge you. Thanks for coming.